Could several undrafted free agents have a shot at making the Seahawks roster in 2023 on the heels of their rookie minicamp? Thor Nystrom's going to be joining us to dive into that question on our latest Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12s. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined for our Monday episode by my host in crime, Rob Rang. And we've got a very special guest joining us. Perfect time for the king of undrafted rankings, Thor <laughs> Nystrom, to join us here on the Locked On Seahawks podcast. Thor, we're just coming out of rookie minicamp. We got to watch the 3,000 undrafted players the Seahawks had on the field this weekend. It just felt bigger than usual because they had a small roster going into the draft. Only 52 guys on their roster. They signed 25 undrafted free agents. And you do rankings every single year. You call it the dessert draft. Based (laughs) on your ranking, the Seahawks, they were eating up on the cookies, the ice cream, and the pies. How do you put those rankings together together? And what did you see John Schneider do that earned that number one ranking? Yeah. So first of all, good to be with you guys. And, and second of all, um, I'm carving, you know, what you said about me with the King of UDFA that's going on my tombstone. Um, as, as far as the, the ideology with it, like I get way too into it as you guys can probably imagine. Basically I use a modified trade chart, you know, one of them and I, I triple size it. So it goes from, you know, 259 to around 750. I think I, I end up ranking out a little over 800 guys. I put on my top 500 board, but like, you know, I got a little bit deeper than that in the position rankings, whatever. And then I assign, you know, the players values because of that. And in the UDFA one, you want to skew the, the value of the guys higher, obviously more because you don't have unlimited roster spots. And then, you know, the guys at the very bottom, like they, they don't get any sort of like qualitative weight with that. And then it's basically just sort of adding it after that. And Seattle's, their class was very big, yes. But the, the qualitative part of that is 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 baked in way, way more. And Seattle had more draftable guys and more guys in my top 500 than anyone else. And in fact, I, like this year, the, the, you know, for the five years I've been doing this or so, I've never seen a discrepancy between the number one UDFA class and the number two one as big as I saw this year between Seattle. And I, I think I had uh, Tampa Bay number two. But they're, like the difference between those two, that was bigger than I think three or four different classes at the bottom of the NFL. That's how big the discrepancy was. Wow, that, that's it. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, that, that's the thing is that you know Seattle, of course, has such a great track record uh, of uh, you know signing players as undrafted free agents, but to have that type of discrepancy is uh, you know is noteworthy. I'm happy that you mentioned it, Thor. And and I wanted to kind of you know have an opportunity to kind of introduce you as well. Um, you know, just I, I think that you do a you know, terrific work, sir. There's there's a lot of draft analysts out there, but I don't know anybody who does who digs deeper with these undrafted free agent prospects. And it's one of the things that I like most about. I think that we're going to get into this conversation conversation a little bit more as we go talking about some of Seattle's undrafted free agents, but you do a great job of, uh, you know, providing player comparisons for all of these prospects as well. And you've got some fascinating ones again, that we're going to be kind of talking about here in a moment. But again, before we get into the UDFA class, um, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about you and some of the other draft analysts out there, there's a lot of us uh, in, in the business in, uh, in that nowadays, uh, but you are pretty opinionated. And, you know, I, I feel like some Sometimes I'm a little bit of an easy grader when it comes to, you know, say grading how NFL teams do after the draft. And I was just going to kind of rattle through some of the grades here that, that our distinguished guest here, Thor Nystrom, uh, provided. And, and just for our listeners, in case that they had not read some of his work, which, again, is at fantasypros.com, and he does a great job. Um, but uh, the Seahawks had, in, in, your, in your opinion, sir, um, a C-plus grade for this draft class. And that might sound pretty like, wow, that's, you know, Thor's a little bit lower on Seattle's draft than maybe I might have been or Corbin or some of the other uh, draft uh, analysts out there. But when you look at the, how you graded the rest of the NFC West, sir, uh, the Seahawks are feeling pretty good. Uh, C plus with the, the Los Angeles Rams at a C minus 
And then the Cardinals at a D plus, the San Francisco 49ers, one of your failing grades. And you have the Dallas Cowboys with a failing grade, uh, the Minnesota Vikings, you know, in your own state. I'm not sure how you, you make it to Jimmy John's or anywhere without getting so <laughs> You know, so um, anyways, I, that's one of the things I love about your story is that you give strong opinions and you uh, ex- explain your r- rationale behind that. So uh, anyways, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, I, I think that, you know, everybody who wants to, to read your opinions, um, certainly, um, please make sure that you tell people where to go. But I wanted to talk specifically about the undrafted free agent class. And then the guy that I'm most intrigued by um, it was Landers, Matt Landers, the wide receiver from Arkansas, previously at Georgia, previously at Toledo, um, as some of our listeners know. But you're talking about a guy that has size, has incredible athletic ability. Is he the top guy on your board as far as Seattle's undrafted free agents? And what is it about him that you like? Or is there any other players that really jump out in, in your opinion of Seattle's class? First of all, thank you for the kind words coming from you. That that means a ton to me. And as far as Landers goes, yes, to your question about if he was the highest and significantly so. I, I had him 179th on my board. I was really – like so let's start with the negatives. He's old and he doesn't run great routes. It's one of the reasons that he wasn't super-duper productive in college. So it's a chance, right? Like it's it, it's a shoot-the-moon chance or whatever. But you, you're not really shooting the moon when you're, you're buying him as a UDFA. I was really surprised in this – we talked about this all process like this wide receiver class was real bad and it was especially thin on true outside boundary guys landers six almost six four and a half 200 pounds and he had a 98th percentile size adjusted athletic composite and and we knew he was a freak athlete i mean it's one of the reasons that all those teams pursued him and he was like a high recruit everything like that but like just on that there was so few receive you know boundary receivers in this class that had that size and that athletic profile, like you're talking about, like literally you can count it on one hand and Landers had that. And yet he, he goes undrafted Seattle. Of course they took Jackson, Jackson Smith and Jigba. And right now they have one of the best uh, starting trios of receivers in the NFL. But behind that, as you guys know, you don't have very much depth. And so Seattle went whole hog on, I mean, the, the whole UDFA class, but specifically with the wide receivers, they got three guys that I, I rated, you know, fairly high uh, top three ten. I, I guess, you know, between Landers, between CJ Johnson and Jake Bobo, those three guys were top 10 uh, wide receiver UDFAs on the board and Seattle goes out and gets all of them. One of those guys at least is making this roster and we'll see, you know, maybe two can squeeze on whatever, but like at least the, the best guy that, that performs out of that is making it w- with Landers. Again, you're just trying to teach him how to do the routes. And, and I understand the reason that the, the NFL was sort of skittish despite that athletic profile is like, this kid's already 24. He's still very raw as a route runner. And it's like, sure, but that is something that perhaps you can teach him, whereas you can't teach any of these other guys his athletic profile in that size package. No, you can't teach a guy that's 6'4", or you can't teach a guy that's you know, 6'1", 185 pounds. You can't suddenly make them 6'4", 200 with 4'3", speed. So sure. he was a guy that I had a midday three grade on myself. But For sure. I, you know, you had your comps, and that's really the thing that jumps out to me. I've never necessarily personally been a guy that – I mean, I sometimes dish out comps, but I'm more interested just looking at the individual traits and trying to – you know, how does each player have a unique skill set? But when I was looking at your rankings at Holton Aylers, the quarterback coming from East Carolina, and then I saw in the player comp Tim Tebow, and after watching him this weekend at Seattle, I'm like, that is – a hammer on the nail, the, the <laughs> hitching throwing motion, the ability to run the football, a bigger body guy. So I guess my questions for you with Ehlers, I mean, this is a guy that was as productive as anybody in college football the last couple of years. He puts up big numbers, throwing, running the football. Is this a player as an undrafted free agent that could maybe make things interesting for Drew Locke with that number two quarterback spot, given the production that he put up? Maybe, maybe not right away, but if nothing else, I would stash that kid on the practice squad for sure. He He's super duper experienced, like you're sort of alluding to. He was one of the top recruits that ECU had ever gotten. And of course they wanted to get him onto the field right away. And they did. 
uh, five-year starter, I think. Like, he'd been doing this for a really long time and super productive over that time. Obviously, one of his favorite targets was another member of the Seahawks uh, UDFA class and C.J. Johnson. But, like, the ECU also spreads the field and likes to throw. And, and so, you know, he's used to going through the progressions, looking over the entire field, different stuff like that. You also have, you know, a kid in a, in a, in a physical package where, where he's he is an absolutely NFL size and also absolutely an NFL-type athlete. A little over 6'3", 227. Um, and his Raz wasn't quite as high, but that kid moves around pretty well, like on the field, you know, both in terms of evading the rush, but also he can get outside of the pocket. He can steal yards as well. But the, the Tebow one, and, and just to be clear to Seahawk fans, I'm not talking about, you know, when they're off the field and, and the way that Tebow talked and, and all that that other stuff. I'm just talking about them on the field. The, the throwing motion out of the lefty, you know, th that's what really jumped out to me about it. And and yeah. the thing that that all layers act or lacks, it's the same thing that, that Tebow did. Well, maybe a couple of things, but the arm strength in particular, um, some of those balls sort of flutter out and stuff like that. But he's accurate, short and intermediate. Um, and again, he knows what he's doing. He w plays within the concept of the offense, shuttles it off to the correct receiver. The defense doesn't have to worry about him with the deep stuff. But he's an efficient quarterback who, again, can steal yards as well, knows what he's doing. I would absolutely try to keep him on the practice squad year one and try and see. I mean, the, the Broncos and McDaniels, they weren't able to do this with Tim Tebow, but try to see if we can improve those mechanics. Any maybe you unlock some more arm strength because he's got that sort of windmilly, you know, awkward kind of motion. If you can fix that, a lot of other things are already in play with that kid. Where if, if, if you can unlock that, maybe you, you have something and a guy that can hang on the active for several years. This episode is brought to you away by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and three-pointers drained. I'm a huge fan of player prop parlays, and you can make bets such as Anthony Davis scoring 20 points at negative 210, plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay there's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than america's number one sports book visit fanduel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's fanduel.com slash locked on fanduel official sports betting partner of the nba yeah i think that's an excellent point um you know in, in the tebow comparison i mean i i just think that it's um you know it, it makes an awful lot of sense again as you mentioned Thor, with the left hand and, and the fact that he does kind of have like a little bit of a hitch in, in his kind of delivery and the ball doesn't just explode out of his hand and mm -hmm. that was one of the things that you know kind of corbin and i were, were talking about as we were watching him in person now you know is he the heisman trophy winner on all those commercials i mean i say nay you know i mean it, it's uh you know it's um, obviously there there is um you you know, very different in terms of personality in that way. But I still was impressed by the leadership skills that he demonstrated. You mentioned the fact, you know, four or five year starter. I mean, he it didn't look too big for him. Whereas some of the other prospects on, on that field, you could just kind of see them looking across Lake Washington, looking around, you know, at the VMAC and, and the different jerseys that are, you know, up with the names up on the, on the, on the walls and things like that, that it, it was a pretty big moment for them. It, quarterback position you don't want to have a guy like that you want to have somebody who is a little bit more grounded and so i was impressed uh by others in that regard so um real quick I, I wanted to kind of shift gears here for a second rather than some of the players you talked about with the ras scores and things like that two guys that i was really intrigued by that didn't have ras scores because they were both coming off of injuries and i don't know what all you know about these two players Thor, because again they don't have the the you know the comparable numbers that we have to some of these other players but um the the florida state defensive tackle robert cooper is one of the nose guard candidates that i'm intrigued by um and and then the other one being the north dakota state tight end actually noah gindorf um did you have any thoughts on, on those two players in particular I do. Uh, Gindorf actually grew up 30 minutes from me. I'm from Brainerd, Minnesota. He's from Crosby and his dad, I believe is still the high school coach there. So I, I seen that kid going back a while. Let's start, <laughs> let's start with Cooper though. Cooper's a weird player, right? Where he is sawed off and super muscled up, but like he he's below your threshold for size. And, and I, I don't know what athlete he would have been like if he had tested because the well the pass rushing repertoire is what he needs to improve on it it's totally one note 
And I don't know if he has the athletic profile to sort of overcome the, the, the size limitations with regards to that. But what I know is that kid's play strength is plus plus. If nothing else, he can occupy. And he's sort of like a, like a knuckleball kind of a player because he's sort of unorthodox in the way he plays. But, but you have a kid that's going to win the leverage game, a kid that very, very strong, hard to move him out of the hole. You're going to need to double team him in the run game or and or he's going to occupy and be the linebacker's best friend, allow the linebackers to flow, whatever. The reason that kid didn't get drafted, you know, in part, like you're mentioning, didn't put out the, the athletic profile coming off the injury. But then the other thing is I just don't know what you get from him as a pass rusher. But on the other side against the run, I, I think that will play at the NFL level despite that lack of size. Because that kid, I mean, like the play strength is, is what that kid's forte is. So, like, they'll just have to work on and see what you can get in the pass rush and then decide if the juice is worth the squeeze to give him a roster spot. Certainly, I think he would be worth a practice squad spot if if not. As far as Gindorf goes, I was kind of surprised that Gindorf didn't get drafted. Like, you know, he, he had a solid career. And in, you know, this tight end class, you had sort of, you know, there was only the one taken in, in round one. You had sort of that bonanza in round two, but then it, it sort of went dormant for a little bit. Get, you know, a lot of these kids that we saw drafted, it was like, you know, the big slot kid or maybe a kid that that um, profiles better as like an H-back, whatever. Gindorf's a true inline guy. Like, yeah. absolutely, you know, both in terms of the frame, but also the game. Like, yeah. how many how many inline guys in this class had that size and are as good at blocking as that kid? If, if you play in line at NDSU, you ain't getting on the field and it, unless you block your butt off. And that kid most certainly does. The, the limitation that he's facing right now and, and presumably the reason that he wasn't drafted is very raw as a receiver. But th they can get him in the building. And there's one specific thing you work on that kid with from the jump. It's running the routes. What I know he can do, he knows how to use that enormous body when the ball's coming. He'll pin you to his back, uh, you know, has a basketball background as well, box you out. And he's very good in those contested situations. Sort of think like a, a poor man's Michael Mayer in terms of that. He ain't beating you down the seam or anything like that. And he's not creating a ton of separation. But once that ball's on the way, he can pin that the defender to his back. And even if he's hanging on his back, he he come down with it. He, he's got good hands. You just have to teach him more of the routes because he's not going to create any separation right now in the NFL. Let's talk about who is, in my opinion, the most fascinating undrafted player on Seattle's free agent list. And some of our listeners will be like, oh, no, here we go again. But Jonah Tavai, <laughs> you, look, you look at the measurements in terms of arm length and athleticism, 29-inch arms. That doesn't look like an NFL defensive tackle. He's 5'10". If you've got a couple bricks underneath his cleats, he's got a 5.0640 time. None of that screams NFL player. And yet, I told Rob this, and I'll say it again. I had to double-check my phone the other day taking video of him doing pass rushing drills because I thought my phone was on one-and-a-half speed with how fast his hands were moving. I've never seen a guy, and I've been covering the NFL now for almost 10 years. I have never seen a guy that has hands that quick. And being short and stocky, it seems to me like that would be beneficial to him, at least as a situational nose tackle. That's what it looks like they're going to be trying him out as. But – you had Mike Daniels as your cop on your ranking, and I immediately got super excited because I think Mike Daniels was one of the best players that never got attention on those really good Packers teams. If Seattle could get anything close to that out of Jonah Tavai, another short, stocky guy that's got some pass rushing ability, really productive, uh, it feels like this could be a guy that we're talking about in a few years with this team. For sure, yeah. We were talking about how Robert Cooper is unorthodox, and 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 Tavai is too. It's just the complete opposite way, right? Like with Tavai, yeah. it's the pass rushing stuff. He has that ridiculous arsenal of moves, like you're saying, and he knows what he's doing with the hands. He lacks length. He lacks the measurables, everything like that. But the hands play and the pass rushing moves play too. He's like a, it's like a jukebox just toggling through. You shut down the first move. He's going to the second one. He's going to the third one. Going to the fourth one. He he's not like Kalijah Cansey in terms of like the movement. In terms of the athletic profile whatnot but he's the same in that like you shut down the one he's going to the you know it's like hitting the, the the fast forward button on the itunes or like to the next song you just keep hitting it you shut down one move he's going to the next one you shut down that one he's going to the next one and like he'll just keep cycling through um until he can get free so i you know I, I like that one where it doesn't cost you anything and then you bring him in and then you just see if you can work on the body i i think this is another one where it's a perfect practice squad stash for one year try to get him you know up a little bit and wait Try, try to improve the run defense a little bit. See, see if he can anchor it all as far as that stuff goes. But the hands and the pass rushing moves speak for themselves. So does the production. 
Again, excellent points, Thor. And again, thank you for your analysis. So when, when you kind of just mentioned here about like if you're you know, scrolling through a song on iTunes or whatever, it, it reminded me of one of the other things that I, I'm, I'm just going to take this opportunity to publicly thank you uh, on your Twitter account, which uh, for those of you who are following on Twitter, it's at ThorKU in, in, in terms of uh, Kansas University, of course, Jayhawk, proud Jayhawk alum over there. Um, you mentioned a couple of years ago some musical advice and suggested that people should download the song by Jack Harlow. Uh, what what's popping? And oh, yeah. I had never heard the song a- until that. And so, because Thorne Eichstrom told me and told the rest of social media that this song slap is the word that you use, <laughs> I uh, I played it, and I'll be damned if that song didn't just slap. And I absolutely loved it. I've downloaded several Jack Harlow songs again. Uh, you know, to your credit. So again, uh, very multi-talented Mr. Nystrom over here. Uh, I'm going to switch back over to football for just a moment real quick, though. Um, And as far as Seattle's actual drafted prospects, um, as I mentioned before, you gave Seattle a C plus. So my last question for you here, sir, is like, what did you like? What did you not like about Seattle's actual draft class? What I loved was the first round. Um, like, I, I don't know how you can argue with that. Witherspoon, you know, it's like, I, I mean, the whole process, he was CB1 with a bullet for me. But like, what was sort of surprising was like, nobody ever talked about him as one of the elite, you know, not just cornerbacks, but one of the elite defenders in this class. I always thought he deserved to be mentioned with Will Anderson and Jalen Carter in particular, because I had him as the third defender in this class. And he absolutely, in my opinion, deserved to be spoken about like those two guys, just in terms of the on-field you utility he's one of my favorite cornerbacks to come out since i've been doing this you know five or six years been ranking out the guys i just love his game it's not just that you can't throw on him he shuts down one side of the field it's also literally every single play he is a problem to the offense you try to run to that kid's side good luck you're not blocking him you're not keeping him out of the backfield and he's coming he's the terminator but like even if you like you could you can barely complete passes on him. Like in, in college, you know, the last, I think it was the last 10 games. Cause actually it was, it was funny. The second game, he actually struggled last year, just a little bit. I, he gave up around a hundred yards. So when you think about the context of, you know, I, I know that Seattle fans know how few yards he gave up last year. Basically half of them came in one game in the second game, the last 10 games of Devin Witherspoon's college career is some of the most dominant tape you will ever see. And, and teams just were like, well, we just ain't throwing at him anymore. We're not going to do that because we're not going to give him a shot to flip the field, especially when we probably have a lower shot at completing the pass. So so I love that. Jackson Smith and Jigba, what, what a stroke of luck there. Uh, I mean, like there were teams where I didn't think Jackson Smith and Jigba was a great fit for. You mentioned I'm coming to you guys from Minnesota. Minnesota needed a number two receiver, but they've gone to 12 personnel because they signed Josh Oliver. Obviously, last year they traded for TJ Hawkinson. So their rece- the, the second receiver that they were going to draft, he had to play on the outside. Uh, the Chargers, another team we knew was, was going to draft a wide receiver, they already had Keenan Allen in the slot, so they needed a true sort of boundary guy. Seattle was the one that was picking that needed that slot. And, and when is the last time we've seen a slot come out? a prospect that was as good of a slot prospect as Jackson Smith and Jigba was, we know he's going to dominate that because the same thing that we've seen at Ohio state where you have the two uh, stud boundary guys who are going to create the space form in the intermediate area. Nobody's covering Jackson Smith and Jigba one-on-one in the intermediate area. He's such a good route runner, but then the joist, the the agility, the joystick agility, it's absolutely ridiculous. And we proved he didn't need to prove the concept because he's seen it on tape but just dusted literally every player, regardless of position in both the agility drills at, you know, uh, during the pre-draft process, whatever. So that was the stuff that I loved. Some of the decisions later on, um, some of them were, were what I felt were reaches and some of them were on players that I love, but it just confused me. And, and to the latter point, Charbonnet, I'm really curious to see what goes on there. I loved Zach Charbonnet. In fact, I loved him so much. I actually ranked him ahead of Jameer Gibbs. Zach Charbonnet was my RB2. I, I love Zach Charbonnet's game. But going to Seattle, it's like, and, and they, you know, obviously with Kenneth Walker from last year, and it's like uh, another round two pick. And it's like, you know, afterwards, they when they addressed the media, they were like, oh, we needed to improve our screen game and, and all this sort of stuff. This sort of insinuation being that's why Charbonnet was picked. But then they take Kenny McIntosh later. And it's also you wouldn't put the round two pick into that. I, In terms of the value of the slot, I absolutely think that it is more than justified taking Charbonnet there. Again, love his game. 
but I'm really curious to see how they use those two guys together. That was just one confusing one for me. And then later on, I, I didn't think they, they Seattle did as good a work, you know, a little bit nitpicky for sure. But to your point about the way that I grade, I grade, I, you know, the way that I do it, it's on a straight curve. So I have a couple A pluses every year. I have a couple Fs and basically every other grade is evenly distributed throughout. So even though for some other graders, C plus might be the worst grade they would give out. So some people might be like, oh, you hate Seattle's draft, whatever. For me, it's it's actually literally above average. You know, like, you know, if, if you looked at it one through 32, probably it'll be like the number 13, number 14 class in the NFL. So I actually like Seattle's class. It just doesn't look like that, you know, because I, I do the, you know, the, the uh, curve grading. Yeah, Rob and I both have teaching backgrounds. Rob is still teaching. I did for seven years. So you're just deploying the bell curve, good sir. That's and right. That's right. People just got to pay attention to that. But C plus on a bell curve is pretty solid grade. We really appreciate you coming on and joining the show, Thor. It has been a blast. Before we let you go, though, I want to go back to the UDFAs one more time. Obviously, with 25 players signed in undrafted free agency, we weren't going to have time to talk about every single one of those guys but who would be one name on that undrafted free agent list that nobody is talking about that you think has a chance to make the Seahawks 53 man roster? Well, I, I'm sure, you know, if Seattle's anything like Minnesota, y'all are like talking about every one of the guys. So like, I, I, I can't make a supposition as, as to who, you know, Seattle's not talking about, but as far as a couple guys that we didn't probably the number one guy would be Griffin a bear. I like that kid's game and it's not like, so I run this 50 team college fantasy football league during the fall where there's no duplicate players. We use all 131 teams, whatever. Griffin Abair was a guy that last fall I was, I was, I was winning games with because he had tight end eligibility, but was still being used as the wide receiver in the offense, essentially that he used to be just last year. He was like the big slot guy. He's gain weight, gain weight, gain weight, but he's still a really, really good athlete. And, and I like this, this sort of shot on his development here where you have a kid, 6'1", he's up to about 240. Again, he has those wide receiver skills. You've also seen him uh, working out of the slot and winning out of the slot last year before he suffered the injury. And I like the idea of trying to bring him in and see if you can get turn him into a sort of H-back. He's never going to be a true inline or an inline tight end, period, because he's only 6'1", 240 right now. And the other thing is, you know, even as the, the sort of H-back, fullback, you know, whatever, you know, if you want to turn him into that, anything outside of the big slot – you, you need him to teach him to block a little bit better because he still sort of blocks like a wide receiver. He's a little bit finesse with that. But as far as the, the NFL utility, when he has the ball in his hands, throwing him the ball from any place on the field, he can absolutely do that stuff. He's super skilled and he is a very, very, very good athlete. So you talk about a ball of clay that you bring in, a kid who, who just switched sort of positions utility wise last year on Louisiana Tech. Now you're probably going to switch him again and try to make him sort of an H backy. Uh, fullback type move piece kind of a guy you need to keep adding weight to that kid and you need to teach him the blocking technique but if you can do that the receiving thing is already there and he is already a plus plus nfl athlete there's a lot there if you can just teach him that stuff yeah he's a player that was on my short list just because i'm a fullback traditionalist and i was like hey they might have somebody that maybe can play a kyle use check type type yes. role with some development there but again thor we greatly appreciate having you on the show can you let our listeners know where they can see your work including that awesome undrafted rankings piece appreciate you boys yeah um all the nfl draft works up on fantasy pros and you can find me on twitter at thor ku special thanks again to thor nystrom the guru of undrafted rankings and the king, whatever you want to call him, it's all going to be on his gravestone after this show. So we appreciate you taking the time to join us, man. And we'll see which one of these undrafted players ultimately ends up making Seattle's roster. Appreciate you, boys. Thanks, Kenthor. When we return here on our Monday edition of Locked on Seahawks, Rob Rang and I are going to be taking some closing remarks here after Seahawks rookie minicamp. What were some impressions coming out of Saturday's practice, primarily from the 10 player draft class. We're going to be getting those here in a moment here on the Locked On Seahawks. Welcome back. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined as always by my co host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there, as always, for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. For our everydayers out there, we've got a very special guest set to join the show tomorrow to dive into the scouting process. 
behind Seattle's new 10-player draft class. Should be a blast of a show, so make sure that you are listening in. We'll be rolling that out at 6.15 p.m. Pacific time, so make sure that you're watching live on YouTube. Let's get to rookie minicamp. Normally, it's a three-day festivity, but this year, the Seahawks trimmed it down to just two practices. They had their walkthroughs that weren't open to the media, but two open practice sessions. And Rob, everybody was wanting to see Devin Witherspoon and Jackson Smith and Jake, but we didn't get to see much from them in either one of the two days. But that doesn't mean that draft picks were not making positive impressions, especially the day three guys. Yeah, absolutely. I think the day three guys is where you got to start the conversation off. And, um, you know, as you said, uh, everybody's going to focus in on the top two picks because, of course, we're expecting them to come in and hit the ground running, perhaps be starters right out of the box. But I think that when you start talking about some of those day three players, like uh, Olu Olatimi, for example, I think that he could wind up being a starter as well. And so I spent a fair amount of time during my day uh, out there at the, at the VMAC watching the interior of the offensive line. I wanted to see what the way that Olu Olatimi played. I wanted to see what, how the way that Anthony Bradford played. They're, they're very different players, actually. Bradford Bradford with his size and power and the way he just absolutely just dominated in the blocking sled and, and the, just the, you could just see the explosiveness in his game. When Ola Tumi, one of the things that I was most impressed by is just just his just his bulk. Um, just the way that he's built, kind of low to the ground. Um, but at the same time, with the way that he was kind of moving people around and, and calling out the plays, um, you know, just that to me just kind of speaks to his football intelligence. Um, he's one of those kind of guys that, uh, you know, speak softly, carry a big stick kind of a thing. He just kind of, I, we mentioned this in the last thing, uh, last little segment there with the East Carolina quarterback, Holton Ehlers, when we were talking with Thorne Nystrom about some of the undrafted free agents. And some guys just kind of carry themselves like pros. You can just see their experience. Again, Oluwatimi's experience as a starter, I thought really lended itself well to create a positive first impression um, for the Seahawks. He was the perfect player to watch during these two days. When you consider what Pete Carroll told me, I asked him a question about how you evaluate offensive and defensive linemen this time of year, because we know they can't hit each other. It's prohibited contact. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like they're going to be working on team scrimmage with these guys going full bore with pads on. They can't do that. It's not 1985 anymore. And so trying to evaluate these players can be really tricky. And at the same time, Carol Media was like, hey, that's the first group I'm watching. We open rookie minicamp because he wants to look at the footwork, how comfortable they are with the schemes, line calls, how quickly are they picking up the playbook. And he raved about Oluwatimi. And you would expect that from a guy with over 3,500 college snaps under his belt and center. But just being over there watching the way that he worked in the sled, he doesn't have the power that Anthony Bradford does, but the hand placement is on point. His footwork when they were doing – some drills on zone and, and man gap uh, schemes. His footwork was impeccable throughout those drills. And so you can see the experience, you can see the savvy. And this is the other thing that jumped out to me. When we were watching a few of their team related drills, rookie minicamp, he hasn't played with any of these other guys on the offensive line. And most of them are quite frankly, not going to be in the Seahawks uniform again after Saturday. A lot of those guys were tryout players and he's still up there calling out defensive fronts where the linebackers are at making all the line calls from play one and making it look like he's played with these guys all of his life and you just don't see that very often from centers coming into the league even if they're first round picks to come right in and have that kind of command he developed that leadership at Michigan so he was the player that I was most impressed by I, I also you know there's some bias here I loved it that he opened up in the press conference when we were talking about scheme stuff not many rookies want to do that, but when we started talking run game scheme and working at a pro style offense, he got super excited and went from eight word answers to being really excited. Let's talk about this. And so that is the type of player we're talking about. That you can just tell he loves football. And so Oluwatimi was the most impressive rookie for the entire weekend. I think his teammate Mike Moore is probably a close second just because he passed the eye test. And this time of year, that can be something you got to – take with a grain of salt, but he looked like a 3-4 defensive and defensive tackle hybrid, and it, it, Seahawks fans should be really excited if they can develop him at that position based on what I saw. The two Michigan kids really jumped out. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, as you said with Morris, I mean, he just looks the part. I mean, he's six, seven, 300 pounds. He's got these big, long arms, these big, broad shoulders. I mean, you know, he is a V-shaped, cut-up kind of a, of a guy. As you said, it looks like that kind of classic three, four defensive end, um, you know, and, and so because of that, I, I really think that he's intriguing, but I'm actually kind of going to go with a couple of the other defensive linemen, I mean, Cam Young, um, the the nose tackle, at least drafted to be such, and then Derek Hall, the edge rusher. Um, I, I spent a lot of time watching, um, you know, Seattle's defensive line coaches and, and run these players through drills, and it was a little bit different than what I saw on the offensive line. I saw some yelling and some screaming and some pushing and, and shaking a little bit like, hey. You know, this is how we do things here. And it wasn't, as you said, I mean, contact is not, uh, you know, allowed. Um, but still, there was some real coaching going on there. And this is why we use our hands this way. And this is how we, you know, we do it first this way. And so there's some real teaching going on. And so I, I was uh, really interested um, to hear Damian Lewis, one of Seattle's defensive line coaches, as well as defensive coordinator Clint Hurt, watch Pete Carroll kind of come down there and really pay a great deal of attention to specifically Cam Young, as well as Derek Hall, and was just really intrigued by what both of them offered and, and showed. Uh, Cam Young with just his size, his power. I mean, just the easy, explosive power that I kind of mentioned before with Bradford and then with Hall. I mean, just his um, his burst up field and then talk about a guy who was just built like a brick house. I mean, he looks the part uh, of what you're looking for. So to me, those are guys that I was really excited about. I'll say quickly, uh, just because I'm out, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I know you're going to talk about running backs at some point. Charbonnet and McIntosh, to me, are every bit as, as ex explosive and as exciting as we might have watched on tape uh, i really think the seahawks are going to be very very happy with the two backs that they got in this draft class yeah you led right into what i wanted to finish up with but i i also want to tie in another late round pick here i mainly want to talk about kenny mcintosh but with jarek reed as well yes. Yes. because there are certain players and i know some of our listeners are gonna be like they're not hitting each other they're not playing real football so how can you evaluate anything but there are guys that you can just tell during rookie minicamp when you see him on the field for the first time, you can just tell that kid's got it. And Jarek Reed was one of the couple guys that I circled that I felt that way about coming out of this minicamp because he flies all over the field. You can see that 4-4 burst and the explosiveness just in the minicamp drills. And, oh, by the way, he was playing in the slot. He played both safety positions. They were moving him all over the place in a rookie minicamp. And he looks completely comfortable doing it, which he should. That's what he played at New Mexico. He was the do-it-all defensive back in a 3-3-5 scheme. But it was the athletic tools that really jumped out to me when I was watching this kid. There was a play that there was a reception made at the other side of the field that he probably had no business being in the area there. And yet he ran it down and you could just see the elite speed and burst. And so I'm excited. I've watched this film. I know how the kid can hit. I loved the way he handled his press conference, just his mindset. Former first team all state Mississippi player that got no division one or division two scholarship offers. I'm still trying to put the math together on that one, but the Seahawks are really happy that they got him as a sixth round pick. And then the running back, specifically Kenny McIntosh. I've talked time and time again about the soft hands that he has. Charbonnet made a couple of really nice catches this weekend as well. But there were a couple bad throws by the tryout quarterbacks that were on the field, guys that probably aren't going to be in a uniform again in the NFL, unfortunately. They were throwing the ball down at Kenny McIntosh's shoe tops, and he was plucking it like it was super easy catches. He was playing on basic on Madden. The guy was just reaching down, plucking, and there's a reason he finished second in the country for running backs and receiving yards and has such phenomenal hands. You can see it play out. And so that really drew my attention too, because some of the catches he were making, he was making were really difficult. And so, you know, he's just going to keep putting pressure on DJ Dallas when they get to training camp, because that guy looks like a third down back in today's NFL with those soft hands. He's an underrated pass protector. We'll see that in training camp, but uh, th that was a guy that I thought really impressed this weekend with the limited opportunities and the limited evaluation.
Yeah, no question about it. Um, you know, obviously we would like to have seen a little bit more from Devin Witherspoon, but I could see that he was just chomping at the bit to get onto the field. And the Seahawks were just being, uh, you know, smart and, and allowing that hamstring really to fully heal. Jackson Smith and Jigba did get a little bit more action on Saturday than he did on Friday. And what I saw, I was very, very impressed by. But still, you got to feel good that would be Seattle's very first pick in, um, you know, in Witherspoon, and their very last pick, um, you know, in, 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 the running back, uh, you know, you are you're talking about an absolutely spectacular class in my uh, in my opinion, Corbin. I really think that this is going to be one of those draft classes similar to last year, similar to 2013 class, of course, or the 2012 class, of course, that um, was just the type that helps a team develop into a legitimate Super Bowl contender. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Subscribe and follow Locked On Seahawks on YouTube and make sure you don't miss a single episode five days a week coming up tomorrow we will have a very special guest joining us to detail the scouting process that went into Seattle's new 10 player draft class you won't want to miss it enjoy the rest of your Monday and thanks for listening go Hawks